Well, hello everyone, members of the household of God, the family of God. This is part two of the Godly Repentance, God Calling Us to Repentance series. This will be two out of two, and uh, how God wants us to repent, especially in these end times. I urge you to definitely be looking at the part one. Please listen, watch part one uh, before you get into this one, please. It lays the foundation. Repentance is so vital. Jesus said later on that if we don't repent, we're going to perish. So we have to repent in what God calls repentance. He didn't call Esau's repentance real repentance. Now, neither is repentance, I believe anyway, uh, just a simple line or two that some famous preachers on TV might have people say at the end of their sermon, something like, Lord, I repent of my sins and acknowledge you as my, or I make Jesus the Lord of my life. And then they say, one minister in particular says, with that statement that you've all made, you've all been born again. You've all been saved, okay? I think repentance is much more than the simple words, I repent. Of course, you want to say I repent and mean them, but I think it means a lot more than that. So we'll talk about that today. And frankly, when we properly we repent, we should have the attitude that I am where I am, I'm alive, I'm well, I'm part of God's family because of the grace of God. Looking at poor sinners and what they're going through who are stuck in sin, we might say, there go I, but by the grace of God. But God's grace is greater than my sins, than all my sins put together. His grace superabounds. And so I look ahead to the resurrection. I look ahead to meeting my Savior face to face, is what we would say. So that's all why I say to you, I am a repentant, reforming sinner saved by God's grace, like you, and because we all still fall short, we all still stumble sometimes in sin. There is a verse, by the way, at the end of Jude, where Jude says, God is able to keep us from stumbling. So I want to focus on that too in the coming weeks. But we all still normally, from time to time at least, fall short of the mark. And I admit I still do. I still slip up. I still miss the mark. I still fall short. I still sin. But I'm in good company. Paul, the apostle, said he did the same thing. And Romans 7 definitely said that. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, <clears throat> here's what Paul said. I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God didn't just persecute them. He put many of them in jail. He beat them. He killed some of them, he says, in another place. But by grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But in the past months, I've been practicing something all this year, 2023, something I call constant contact. Be looking for it as a blog or as a short audio sermon. I'm finding myself much stronger on the days, I'm not saying perfectly, but on the days that I practice it perfectly, I feel so much stronger, so much less tempted, so much more walking in the spirit. So I'll discuss all that, the constant contact, contact, contact. <laughs> where'd that happen? So please listen to part one and uh, on, on repentance. One thing I'm learning is that when we truly repent and when we truly see that we need forgiveness, I hope that nudges us to be more forgiving of others than maybe it, we have been in the past, to forgive ourselves as well. That's very, very hard. For many of us, forgiving ourselves is the harder thing to do. But as we see that we need forgiveness, hopefully we can be forgiving of others. And when people who have to forgive us when that happens, painful, painful as it sometimes is, when our actions might have caused them great pain, when they forgive us who have sinned, everyone learns the qualities of God and his mercy and his grace and his pardon and his favor. We all start practicing that. We all become more and more like God. We also have to get rid of the notion that a person who sins again 
especially if it's the same kind of sin that he said he repented of, that person must not be forgiven, the notion that that person must not be forgiven if they commit the same sin again, because they obviously haven't repented. And I have heard that for so many years from so many ministers. I probably have said it myself. The recidivism rate of sinners is quite high. I think all of us, frankly, are no better than Paul. All of us still commit sin, sometimes the same sin. Look what Jesus had to say about that, Yeshua, Jesus. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. Look to yourselves, take heed. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now, we also see the example of Jesus Christ on the cross where he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Long before anybody there had repented of crucifying him, spitting on him, calling him names, and rebuking him, and defiling, re reviling him. But he says, if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, I want you to really sink, let that sink in. If someone sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, in the same day, returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Let's be honest, though. Which of us would forgive someone like that? Which of us would not instead, unless this verse was just shouting at us, because we should know it so well, if we would instead say, forgiving you? Are you kidding? You can't possibly have repented by the third, fourth, fifth, sixth time, seventh time. You've got to do what John the Baptist required of the, of the Pharisees, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. So remember, we looked at what Jesus said here seven times in one day. Why would he say that? I think it's because Jesus knew that you and I would be coming to him and God the Father asking for forgiveness for the very same things, maybe the same day, maybe over a succession of days. And of course, they forgive us. God forgives us. So we, as we become more and more like God, would do the same thing. Because our flesh is weak. Our spirit's willing, our flesh is weak. We still have, now we have two hearts. I want to keep explaining this. We have the old heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. But if you describe your present heart after you receive the Holy Spirit in that same way, you're wrong. You're, you're, that's not the new heart. The new heart is not desperately wicked. The new heart loves God, loves God's law, wants to obey God, wants to please Him. So we have these two hearts now, one spiritual, one very carnal, and they fight against each other. And the one that we feed the most is going to be the one that wins, the one that we feed the most, the one that we strengthen, the one that we study and pray about. The new heart loves God's way. But these two natures, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 25, where it talks all about it. And this is where the constant contact program that I have has helped me tremendously. And I'll share it with you uh, soon. But mankind is good, very good, at dissing or dismissing someone's repentance because we look at them and we say, I don't see that they've changed that much. I don't see that, but they're still doing certain things. Or they have, I've heard they've, so you were part of gossip and you heard that someone did certain things. How could he possibly or she possibly have repented? Anyway, Jesus says we must repent. We must forgive our brother if he comes to us asking for forgiveness. And I covered last time, just doing this as a very, very quick review here. Uh, when we repent, a big part of what we repent of is what we are. We are sinners. Liars, are li liars lie. So we say, Father, forgive me, a liar. Father, forgive me, I've been an adulterer, at least in my heart, maybe in real physical actions. Father, forgive me because I worry and don't show faith. Father, forgive me. I'm such a gossip. Father, forgive me. Whatever it is that you have done, repent of what you are that caused you to do what you have done. It's so much harder and so much more repentant when you say, Father, forgive me. 
I broke your Sabbath. I'm a Sabbath breaker. Not just I broke your Sabbath. I'm a Sabbath breaker. And when we repent like this, when you hear the song Amazing Grace, the line will mean so much more to you. The line that says, who saved a wretch like me. Compared to God, that's what we are. I remember a time when I, when we used to have a, 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 a chimney and all that, I gathered a whole bunch of, not a bunch really, it's just a couple handfuls of ash, put it in a jar, and I put a label on it. It just said me. If I don't repent, that was the notion, if I don't repent properly, that jar of ashes is me. Because Malachi, I think it's 4, around verse 3, it says that the ungodly, the wicked, will be ashes under your feet. The lake of fire burns us up. It doesn't torment or torture us. A loving God's not going to torture or torment us for the rest of our lives. And the wages of sin is death. It's not eternal life in hell being tormented by a loving God. No, it's not. So anyway, uh, please don't put off deeply, deeply repenting. I, I used to put that jar there. Eventually I took it down because... Eventually you don't see, excuse me, for I got itches all over me. <laughs> anyway, um, eventually post-it notes and jars and things we put out there, we don't uh, even notice them after a while. So I like to move things around, and I, I find that I notice them more. And don't put off deeply repenting and seeking after God. You never know when your last moment's going to be. I remember in 1971, I was working on the Rose Parade. They had all these little stands out there where we'd sell beef hot dogs and cookies and drinks and so on and sodas and whatnot. Uh, people would come there. there were, many would camp out the night before in Pasadena. And um, a former classmate of ours who had been thrown out of the school that we were part of for his behavior came by and he said, Philip, I have no money. I have no money, uh, but I'm so hungry. Uh, can you let me have a hot dog? And I said, well, I'll buy you one. He said, well, actually here. And he pulled out a couple pills. I don't know if they were LSD or what they were, but he said, this is worth a lot more than a couple dollars. I said, I don't, 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 I don't want it. But I just paid for the hot dogs and gave it to him. Anyway, as he was eating there, it was a little quiet time. We started talking and I said, you know, you've grown up in the church. You, you know about uh, what's going to happen, and, you, and, and we're in the last days. Of course, that was, uh, what, 60 years ago. Uh, we're in the, no, maybe 50 years ago. We're in the last days, and what are you going to do? And he said, you know what, Philip, I know I need to repent. I'm going to the last hour. In the meantime, I'm going to have some fun. Well, he, in the meantime, died. Something to do with drugs. <laughs> He died long ago in a drug-related death. Anyway, let's read one, 2 Peter 3, 9. I'm going to read this one this time from the World English Bible. Uh, repentance to God is a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. The Lord is not slow. 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise. I'm reading this out of the World English Bible. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowest slowness, but is patient with us, not wishing that any, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But because we have free moral agency, we know there is going to be a lake of fire. We know there are going to be people. Certainly we know the beast and the false prophet of the end time are carefully, clearly told they're going to be in the lake of fire. And others many times are mentioned that as well. But God doesn't want that. So no matter how bad a person has been, God wants that person to repent and be saved, even if they were super bad. But I think if someone was super bad, we sometimes really don't really want them to repent. We really don't want them to be forgiven. If we know of how bad they were, we want them blasted off the planet. Let's be honest. I call that the Jonah syndrome, the Nineveh. He, he would like... He wanted to see what, ha what happened to Nineveh as what happened to Sodom. So here's a test. Would any of you want Stalin or Hitler or a mass murderer, a serial killer, to repent and be forgiven? 
Or do you think they've, they've been so bad that God just can't forgive them? The blood of Christ, the grace of God is not enough to cover that. I mean, it's just a test of where you are on this. God wants nobody to perish. So again, repenting means to be sorry, to feel that godly sorrow about our sins, confess them, ask for forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ, and then we must be sure we turn back to God. Repent means to turn, turn back to God. We don't want to keep sinning in the old way that we used to live, and uh, though we still do from time to time, we repent and our hearts are rending. Joel 2, verses 12 to 13, rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend your hearts and not your garments. And our lives have to change. Even Nineveh, it says they repented of their works. They repented of their violence and turned from uh, the violence that was in their hands, at least that much. And, then, and, and God saw that, and God felt that was enough, that he forgave the whole city. Even though I doubt that they all started keeping Sabbath and all of them had thrown away all their idols, I doubt that they were living perfectly after that, or perfectly obediently. But their attitude, their humility was enough that God changed his mind. Now, let me hasten to add, some people, of course, I said, there's some emotion with this repentance. Uh, Peter wept bitterly uh, when he realized what he'd done in denying his Lord three times. He wept bitterly. I am emotional. If you're not an emotional person, you may find it harder to cry, to show emotion. It doesn't mean you're not repentant. It just means you're not an emotional person. So please don't judge a non-emotional person as someone who hasn't repented yet. Okay, just want to toss that in. I also believe included in godly repentance, especially prior to baptism, is an acknowledgement that you have accepted Jesus as the Son of God who died for your sins. You want his blood to cover you and you acknowledge that God the Father resurrected him from the dead and that he is now your life. We believe and know he was raised from the dead and uh, the resurrection Jesus Christ is now our life. He's now living again, this time in us. As Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I, I was crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live is now by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me and loved me. In Colossians 3, 3 and 4, um, your life is hidden in Christ, in God. And when Christ, who is our life, returns, appears, or whatever it says, uh, we shall be like him or with him or whatever. But Christ is our life now. So we are completely torn up when we let him down, when we let Father down, especially the big, big sins that affect so many people. If that's happening now, you might even ask, have I really repented of that big, big sin? And you need to set aside some time to fast. I do from time to time. Set aside time to fast, to seek God, to make sure that you're really on the right track. I think it's very easy to repent casually, to just every day say the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and you've repented. I, I'm, I'm saying in these two sermons, try to get deeper than that. That's certainly better than not saying it at all. And there are times I say the Lord's Prayer, just to remind me of a pattern of prayer and so on. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We may find ourselves thinking we've repented, but that may be, we may need something deeper. And something we talked about last time, remember the end of Ephesians 4, it says, let those who steal, steal no more, but that, let them get a job. So now instead of taking from people, you have something to give people. So whatever your sin is that you're really having a hard time doing and overcoming, what's the opposite of that? Take it to God in prayer and start focusing on doing the righteous opposite. Okay, so we all talked about still occasionally sinning. It doesn't mean we haven't fully repented. And we will all have slip-ups from time to time. But our past can be past. After listing in... Um, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 to 11, a whole bunch of things that if we're doing would keep us from the kingdom of God. He says something I, I, I've told you before. He says, I hope you know that the unrighteous will not be in the kingdom of God. Those who are living a pattern of life of unrighteousness. And he goes on to list a whole bunch. Adulterers, liars, stealers, uh, drunkards, 
names a lot. Idolaters. Paul says such were not, will not be in the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 11, such were some of you, were, but you were washed, washed in the blood. You were sanctified, that means set apart for holy use. You were justified, that means you were made right with God. So God doesn't see you who have been drunkards as still a drunkard if you have repented of that and you're putting it away and hopefully not slip up too often, maybe totally conquer it. So though we repent of what we are, when we repent, let's also be encouraged that I don't think you have to the rest of your life say, I'm a liar, I'm going to gossip. I, hopefully we're overcoming. That's a whole different topic sometimes. Part of repentance is we're getting in, into overcoming and changing and being converted. Conversion is not primarily, now that we keep Sabbath and not Sunday, we don't keep Christmas trees. Conversion is the heart is changing. Such were some of you. We also mentioned how there's great joy in heaven when somebody repents. That's hard to believe when someone was such a terrible sinner. Are you sure they're really celebrating? Or are they saying, oh, no, we got to accept him too as a child of God? Jesus said twice in Luke 15, there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who repents, one sinner who repents, than 99 righteous who don't need to be repenting. More joy over the sinner, the bad guy, who said he's sorry, please forgive me, I want help to change, than the 99 who are good guys. Anyway, I have a couple more things I want to be sure we're aware of, so let's keep moving. Beware the attitude when you come to repent or talk to a minister about it. I was getting ready to baptize you. These are things said to me as I was getting ready to baptize, and I was asking them questions to show me the depth of their repentance. Well, I might bring something up, and they might say, well, that's just the way I am. See, I'm, I'm Jewish, or I'm German, or I'm Italian. I'm French. And you know, French love romantic things and sex and all that. And Germans, you know, we can be tough and rough. And so don't expect, don't expect that to change. That's part of my DNA. Do I have to repent of being American or being whatever? Or I like to drink. That's just the way I am. Sometimes I, yeah, sometimes I get drunk. Or I love women. That's just the way I am, you might say. So no, I, I don't know that I can give everything up. When we're baptized, we're giving up everything that is contrary to God and contrary to God's way. Another version of this is, that's just the way I am. Please accept me the way I am. And do I really have to give up everything? I repented of most things. But now what we're talking about, that's part of me. Do I really have to totally give up everything I enjoy? Do I really totally have to give up crab and shrimp uh, salad? Do I really, really have to give up sometimes being willing to just holler at people and lose my temper? That's who I am. It's just a little thing. It's not a big deal. I've had people say that. It's just a little thing. And I like to usually come back and say, Goliath was once a little thing. It grew up. It got worse. It got bigger. So I tell people, what you're asking me to do would be like if I... In, when I come to baptize you, I, le I let you poke your elbow up out of the water and not cover it, not immerse everything. No, when you're baptized, you're burying everything about you, everything. So another area to be aware of, it's a tendency of some not to allow someone we deem really, really bad to really repent. I've heard people use the term that lady is totally disgraced for what she's done. That's a disgraced minister for what he's done. The world does that a lot. We in the body of Christ should not be saying things like that. How can so-and-so possibly ever be any good after all he's done? Be careful. The standard you use on others can be, probably will be used against you. Matthew 7, around verse 2 or 3. The standard you use will be used against you. And don't forget, Romans 5, verse 20 and 21 says, 
that when sin abounds, God's grace superabounds. There's much more grace than there is sin. Much, much more. But let's stop remembering or thinking of people by the worst thing they did. You know, Samson and Delilah. Martha, Martha. Martha had some great statements about the resurrection and eternal life and who Jesus was. Yet we think of her complaining that Mary wouldn't come out there and help her with the kitchen work. Thomas is doubting Thomas. Samson and Delilah. David and Bathsheba. You see what I'm saying? Let's not be like that. Certainly in the kingdom of God, I hope nobody will say, oh, that's Rahab the harlot. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Oh, here's Uriah. Hey, how did you feel when you found out what happened to you? Don't do that. The Bible doesn't do that. Hebrews 11 doesn't do that. The list of all the men and women of faith. Do you know, find me some negative things said about those people. There's lots of negative in the Bible about them, but in the final, in the final telling of it in Hebrews 11, you think they all were perfect because by that time they were. It's the life of Jesus Christ covering them. So do remember, though, that real change is expected. God loves repentance. He loves having a relationship with us. No matter how bad the sin was, God is rejoicing when you repent. Like the father of the prodigal son, the father went out there running to greet him. Now, to the good guys watching this going on, something in our heart sometimes would prefer the prodigal son get a whipping instead. Tie him to a post. Let's give him 20 lashes. At least just 20. But let's make him feel a little bit. I hope we're not like that. We have to absorb this truth about you, your repentance, about mine. God is happy when we repent, even if we come back seven times in a day saying, I repent, we are to forgive them, Jesus said. Like I said, I'll bet you that's really news to most of you. <clears throat> it's news to most ministers I know. He's focused on our repentance more than on, on our atrocious sins that we've done. Look at the basis for the Luke 15 series of stories. Go back to the beginning of Luke 15, or maybe it's the end of Luke 14. But the Pharisees and the righteous people of that time saw Jesus hanging out with the bad people. And they criticized him for that. But because that's what they did, we get all these wonderful stories. My, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, the lost sheep, the lost silver coin, the lost son, the prodigal son. So <clears throat> all those great stories started because people were criticizing the ones Jesus was hanging out with. So if you've done wrong and repent, Jesus will hang out with you too. Remember, God often renamed people of what we're going to end up being. And again, sometimes it's harder to forgive ourselves. Do remember, though, that if you were there on the, at the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Last Supper, the Son of God would have washed your feet. He even washed Judas' feet. Judas hadn't left yet. I know some of you think otherwise. Look at John the story in John, is it 13 or 12? I think it's 13. Uh, go back and read the story there. Judas was clearly still there. Go back into around verse 20, 22, somewhere. I wasn't prepared for that, for that section here. I'm just thinking of it now. But the day Jesus, the night Jesus washed Judas' feet, he would have washed yours as well. Now, repentance goes way beyond confession, asking forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians 7, we have a description of true righteous repentance, godly repentance. <clears throat> there was a sinner, 1 Corinthians 5, who had some really perverted sexual sins going on. Paul told them all to get rid of him, get him out of your church. By the time you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he's telling the Corinthians, hey, what are you doing? How come he's still out of the church? He's repented, bring him back in. Don't leave them out there. Don't think we don't want that kind in here anymore. Come on. Sin is a sin. Bring them in. <clears throat> in 
And then in chapter 7, 2 Corinthians 7, Paul describes what the church brethren did go through. My point is, if you've done something pretty awful beyond the ordinary sins, don't think you're not forgivable by God. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 to 11. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner. Godly sorrow, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow produces change, produces turning back to God. I'm translating repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. There's nothing to be regretted about that. But the sorrow of the world produces death. I observed this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. That's the I am a sinner type. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. Now the New Century Version says, But because your sorrow made you change your lives, which the other one says led you to repentance, you became sad in the way God wanted you to, so that you were not hurt by us in any way. The kind of sorrow God wants, verse 10, makes people change their hearts and lives. Godly sorrow produces repentance, in other words. This leads to salvation, and you cannot be sorry for that. But this kind of sorrow, but that kind of sorrow the world has, brings death. So we have to have the right sorrow. And it has to result in some fear that, oh dear, how did I get, get that far along in sin? Or even as a group, what vehement desire to clear things up? What zeal? What vindication? What diligence? Now we're diligent to pray. Now we're diligent to seek after God. Now we're diligent to change. Asking God to help us change. And yet, you know what? After saying all this about uh, the church of Corinth, which was one of the most corrected churches in all the Bible, we read at the end, he's just told them how great their godly sorrow was, but not everybody. Not everybody. 2 Corinthians 12, there it says, verse 21, after saying he hoped things would be different when he came to Corinth again, he says this, 2 Corinthians 12, 21, Lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many of you who have sinned, who have sinned before, and have not repented of the uncleanness, the fornication, the lewdness which they have practiced. So 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is telling them, in spite of my commending so many of you, some of you haven't repented. Need to. Corinth had all these temples, not just one or two or three, they had like four or five or six, to Aphrodite, the sex goddess, to Venus, to different ones, to Apollos, um, to Apollo. Anyway, so uh, the one to Aphrodite was basically sin with temple prostitutes. who were called the, temple, the, the Vestal Virgins, the te Temple Virgins. They weren't virgins. But even now you'll hear some commentators saying, well, we don't know for sure if they did that. Well, anyway, they were deeply into that kind of sin. So when you pray in repentance, pray that God grants you true repentance. Grants you, not just remorse, but grants you, gives you the gift of true repentance. Over the years, counseling with different ones, I have had a number of people who really have felt they were just simply too bad to ever come into the church, to ever be part of the fellowship, or to ever be accepted by God. They were just simply too evil in their past actions. Can you ever be too bad? Because sooner or later, most of us, most of you, will have done something that will make you wonder if you can be forgiven of this. Remember 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Some will perish, but God's dream is to save us, as many as possible. So some of you won't bother to repent because as you've told me, some of you, because you figure it's no use. You've been too bad. Well, hey, the prodigal son story, that was pretty bad. And yet the father ran out to meet him. He'd heard the stories. 
When God Ran, I love that song. I hope you, it's in my link to my last sermon on this. God can't possibly love me. God can't possibly want me there in his fellowship. God can't possibly have any use for me, nor want to forgive me, you might think. I've been there. The prodigal even planned to say, Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Luke 15, verses 18 and 19, I think. Father never even let him get that far in his planned, what we might call the elevator speech. You know, what he was going to say. Well, I've been there too. I, I, it's, I see that as my story. I hope you see it as your story too. Your sin caused the death, the brutal death, your sin did, of the Son of God. And if he was being scourged and then being nailed to the stake, the beam, the tree, whatever it was, I had no problem saying cross. Sometimes it was a cross, sometimes it was a stake or a tree. But if you, if you could have watched that nailing going on, and if you ask what's going on, well, this is because you sinned. You, your sins. So we have to come to see that, okay? So maybe no one wants you around. Maybe even your family doesn't want anything to do with you. You're hurting. You want to be different. You want to change. But you feel abandoned. You feel you've been too overboard, beyond the pale. And so you reason, even God's people won't accept me. God's people, let's not be like that. Forgiving sin is God's responsibility. We can forgive what a person did against us, but the spiritual penalty of that is God's responsibility. He's the judge, not us. He's the judge of that. So when we think that his people, his righteous people, won't want us around again, they wouldn't want me even to be seen among them or associated with them. They don't want my kind around. If you have thoughts like that, some of you do. Some of you are hearing this from within a jail cell. I come to you asking you, keep listening, please. And any of you who think like that, we don't want this kind of person or that kind of person or that person with that color or that ethnic group or that bias or that sin history. We just don't want them among us. You're going to have the same standard used on you, Matthew 7, 2. So if we're honest with Scripture, it's the really bad ones God actually wants to encourage and to reform. The really bad ones. You heard me right. When did you last hear that? Perhaps even you. Let me give you an example. Who was the first person that Yeshua, Jesus, that Yeshua revealed himself to as, I am the Messiah? Do you know who that was? Go look at the ch chapter 4 of John, John 4. Yeshua was in Judea, and he had to go to Galilee. The, clear, the, the fastest way was a straight line up right through Samaria. And where Jacob's well is, I think, is modern-day Nablus. It was a, today's a very violent place for Jews or Americans to even be in Nablus. Samaria, you know, uh, Shechem, I think, was where uh, these were all Samarian, Samaritans, but I think the town was Shechem. But anyway, um, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But the Samaritan woman at the well came to the well at noon, at the sixth hour. Why would she gather, collect her water at the hottest time of the day? Because that's when she knew nobody, none of the other women would be there. What had happened was Her life was not very good. She was too ashamed to be gossiped about, pointed at, whatever, with the other women. She, so she would go when they weren't there. And if you read carefully what it says in John 4, it says Jesus was going to Galilee and he had to go through Samaria. Now he didn't have to go through Samaria as far as the route. He could have gone around it. But I think it's saying... He knew he wanted to be in Samaria to meet this woman. I am not a big fan of the, of the show called The Chosen 
although some of what they've done is spectacular. I suggest you do watch the, the eight minute or so clip that I have on the woman at the well. I'll put it in the notes. You can just click on it. Now, I know the Jesus of, who plays Jesus, I forget his name now, Rumi, is that his name? Um, he's a Catholic and he has long hair, uh, long hair to here, not super long like you see in some pictures and drawings and paintings. Uh, people get mixed up. He was, he was a, he was not a Nazarite, which someone who had to not cut their hair. He was a Nazarene. He was from Nazareth. And we get that mixed up sometime and think Jesus had long hair. He did not. He would not. It was he, the word, who inspired in the book of 1 Corinthians that men should not have long hair. Should not. So any of you men who have long hair, the Bible actually says do not unless you're under a Nazarite vow. John the Baptist was. John the Baptist had long hair. I think Samuel had long hair. Nazarites. Jesus was not a Nazarite. He was from Nazareth, so he was a Nazarene. But anyway, some of you won't bother watching it just because of that mildly long hair. I, I suggest you watch it anyway. He's a Catholic, and the Mormons help fund all this. But if you know your Bible well, I think you can watch certain episodes and pick out the stuff that you know is not right. Otherwise, you'd have to quit watching any movie about the Bible, the Ten Commandments, any of them, because they all have some things wrong. So I have reservations, but I thought this particular one, they did a particularly good job. The woman ends up saying when she leaves, this man told me everything about me. And they show that in that clip. Why would she say that unless there was more to it than what we read in John 4? But anyway, Jesus, I think, wanted to encourage this woman who felt so abandoned and so ashamed. And then in verses 25 and 26, you think God's not answering you? You think God wants, doesn't want anything to do with you? I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I don't know if he said he was the Son of God there. I know he said I'm the Messiah. first person who heard that was this woman who was on her sixth man. She had had five husbands. And even the one you're with now is not a husband to you. So she was on her sixth husband. And Jesus says, but God still cares about you. I know because I came here to see you. And then she in her joy evangelizes the whole town. Tells them about Jesus. I think that says a lot about how God views our ability to repent and still be used. How happy she was to have Messiah reveal himself to her first. She immediately spread the news. Luke 7, verses 47 to 48. Those who know they've been forgiven a lot will love God more than those who do not know how much they've been forgiven of. Out of the New Living Translation, Luke 7, verses 47 and 48, Jesus was having a meal with the Pharisees, and they partly laid down, and this woman who was known as a terrible sinner comes in, starts weeping and wiping her tears off with her hair and anointing his feet with oil, very expensive oil, Oil And the Pharisee was thinking in his heart, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. And Jesus, being God, knew their thoughts. And I'll just read a couple of verses. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven little shows only little love. Not just towards God, but to other sinners who have repented. If you know how much you've repented and you've been forgiven yourself, you're going to be a lot kinder to other people who need a lot of repentance. You're going to show them a lot of love. You're going to show God a lot of love. Another one's Mary Magdalene. Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Mary Magdalene, probably the town crazy woman, had seven demons cast out of her. Those demons, no doubt, were leading her to a lot of crazy things and sinful things. 
Luke 8, 1-3 came to pass afterwards. He went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits. Probably not just Mary Magdalene in this list, but certainly Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary called Magdalene from, from the city of Magdala, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Steward, and Susanna, and many others, many other women who provided for him from their substance. This woman was the crazy woman. Mary of Magdala. Who was the first to see the risen, resurrected Jesus Christ. He hadn't even gone to heaven yet to be accepted by the Father. Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when he arose early the first day of the week, he appeared first. Mark 16, 9. First to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven demons. And after being accepted by God in heaven, on wave sheaf day, the first one he appeared to after being accepted by God and now returning to earth was... Peter, who had sworn, had made an oath, I swear, I don't know that man. Certainly didn't die for him. He told him, God, don't worry about all, if all these others leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I'll die for you. And then he wept bitterly. Probably was very disconsolate. Probably was really down on himself. And on wave sheaf day, which means acceptance, which means the, it, it pictures the first fruits being accepted by God on behalf of the rest of the harvest. So Jesus spent the rest of that day cheering his disciples up, the two on the road to Emmaus. Why are you so cast down? What's going on? And then when he took the bread in his hands, they could finally at that point see the nail holes, the bottom of the palms, Right at the top of the wrist. It's where they would do it. That was still considered the hand. And then he disappeared. They rushed back. My, my point is, they'd already, they said that he's already appeared to Peter. So don't dare you, don't you dare in the kingdom point someone out to say, hey, that's Rahab the harlot over there. She doesn't remain that way. In fact, she's one of the few who are mentioned as being in the lineage of the, of the Christ, of the Messiah. I think there are five women, Mary and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, Mary, the mother of Christ, of course, and Tamar, I think was listed. Who am I missing? Oh, and Rahab. Some of you, uh, and uh, I think Ruth was. Here's my point. You're hearing this because God, I, my, this part of my sermon, I'm trying to tell you, God loves you. God wants even you. I don't care how bad the thing was you did. Okay, I'm going to give some more examples here. How bad they were and God still wanted them. How bad do you think King Ahab was? Married to Jezebel. Married to Jezebel, who brought in all these false prophets of Baal. He was the king of the northern ten tribes of Israel in the time of Elijah. Let me just read a couple of verses. 1 Kings 16.30 Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. So he was pretty bad. Verse 33, same chapter, 1 Kings 16, 33. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, Asherah pole, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger the, than did all the kings before him. An Asherah pole uh, was shaped as a male organ and was used in the worship of Ishtar, the sex goddess. The King James calls it the groves. The groves. It was a very, very sexual idol. And you can read God's decree against Ahab in 1 Kings 21, that they were so evil that God says in 1 Kings 21, verse 23, 24, that the dogs are going to lick up the blood belonging to Ahab who die in a city, and the birds of the earth will feed on those who die in the country. And Jezebel, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And there was never a man like Ahab, verse 25, who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. And then this is the NIV, verse 26. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites 
the Lord, Jehovah, drove out before Israel. Verse 27, when Ahab heard the words about the dogs and all that and the blood, he tore his clothes. Now this is the most evil king of the northern tribes. Put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly, softly, quietly. You and I, you and I would say, come on. Ahab, you just stole this land from Naboth and then had him killed. You've just brought on all these horrible things against God's people. You've killed a lot of the prophets where Elijah thought he was the only one left, etc., etc., etc. No, I'm not going to forgive you. That's what probably some of us would reply. Then verse 28, Then the word of the Lord, word of Jehovah, came to Elijah the Tishbite, have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? I'll bet you Elijah even was in his heart. Come on, God, don't be fooled by this guy. He's bad. He's bad. <laughs> because he's humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day. I'll bring it on his house in the days of his son. The worst king ever. Isn't God amazing? So no matter how bad you think you've been, I don't think you've done as bad as Ahab. And even Ahab was heard when he humbled himself and fasted and sought, apparently sought God. The worst king ever, I believe, was Manasseh over Judah. 2 Chronicles 33, I encourage you to read it. I won't have time to read the whole chapter, but I recommend you do. And let it really, really sink into your heart. Man, this guy was bad. And God restored his kingdom back to him. Okay, I'll read part of it. Second Chronicles 33, verse 1, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of Jehovah, following the detestable practices of the nations Jehovah had driven out before the Israelites. By the way, YHVH does not mean Lord, and the word the is not in there, so I often do say Jehovah. And all the evidence I've seen in the latest of years, the newest years, is that they have found thousands of documents, old documents, where there are vowel points in them, and those vowel points are all pronounced without exception as Yehovah. So that's why I say Yehovah instead of Yahweh now. He rebuilt, he, anyway, but that's just, you can do what you want on that. That's what I do. He rebuilt the high places his father, righteous Hezekiah, had demolished. He erected altars to the Baals, made Asherah poles again. Okay, those evil poles, idols. He bowed down to the starry host, worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of Jehovah. Uh, verse 6, he sacrificed his sons in the fire in the valley of Hinnom, where we get the word Gehenna from. He practiced sorcery, divination, witchcraft. This guy's pretty bad. To burn his own sons, to sacrifice his own sons in the fire. Probably to Molech. He did much evil in the eyes of Jehovah, and yet in spite of that, well, I'll read that in a minute. Verse 7, he took the carved image he had made, probably the Asherah pole, and put it in God's temple. Verse 9, Manasseh led Judah and all the people of Jerusalem astray, so they did more evil than the nations God had kicked out before them. Verse 10, Jehovah spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. In spite of all that, what does God want? God wants his repentance. So don't ever feel you're too evil to be forgiven, too evil to repent, even though there may be some horrible thing you do in the future you haven't even done yet. So Jehovah brought against them the army of the commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon, probably connected to that hook in his nose. In his distress, I'm now first, I'm in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 12. In his distress, he sought the favor of Jehovah's God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him, Jehovah was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So God brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that Jehovah is God. 
And then verse 15, he got rid of all the foreign gods. He removed the images that he'd put up and the altars he'd built to the, to the stars and all that. In verse 16, he restored the altar of Jehovah for sacrifice, fellowship. Okay, this is, this is a better repentance. It's not just going around softly. He actually did things. He changed. He turned back to God. Manasseh, whom everybody thinks is the worst king ever. Verse 16, he restored the altar of Jehovah, sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it, told Judah to serve Jehovah, the God of Israel. The people, however, continued to sacrifice at the high places, but only to Jehovah, their God. So my point is God noticed, God heard, God reacted, God forgave these two terrible kings when they did so much just humble themselves. Manasseh went further, I think. But I think overall he still remembered for his horror. It's horrible things because that's what we people do. We remember the sin. We remember how David murdered Uriah. We remember how Samson was always drinking. He wasn't supposed to drink. Touching dead animals. He wasn't supposed to. He was a Nazarite. Having sex sins. And yet he's going to be in the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. And David's going to be king over all Israel in the millennium. And we still read his Psalms. He's still the prophet of God in spite of all of this. God didn't kick him out of the calling he gave him to be king and a prophet and writing Psalms. David continued. Does that tell you something about God? But David also knew how to repent. I would urge you to go study carefully Psalm 51. David's prayer of repentance. I'll read a few of the verses, but for time's sake, I just can't read it and the other things I want to show you. Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. He's admitting that he's sinned. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, my wickedness, my lawlessness. That's what it means. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Someone said they heard a rabbi say that David never really sinned. We've just read him saying he sinned here at least four times now. Against you, here's another one, verse 4, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak, blameless when you judge. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He starts off very dejected, very down. He's already starting to come out of that, though, because he understands, and you and I need to understand, that when we repent, we don't stay down. We mustn't stay down. Accept that forgiveness. Make me hear the joy, gladness, verse 8, that the bones you have broken, O God, may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, there's one creator and he's the one who creates clean hearts. My heart got dirty. My heart got sinful. I need a new heart. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Do not make take your Holy Spirit from me. The child who died was probably at least a year old, maybe two. The, the Hebrew word that's used is a toddler. It's not a, it's not a newborn. A lot going on here. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way. Sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. There he's talking about Uriah now, the bigger of the two sins there. The bloodshed was a bigger sin than the adultery because adultery was temptation that he gave into. The murder of Uriah was premeditated murder. It was worse. But I want you to notice this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Some of us, we get really hard on people who've been really bad. We don't want them ever to have any joy again. It's not God's way. And if you're the one we're talking about, then you have to accept that God wants you to have joy again. David felt that. Uphold me by your generous spirits, then I will teach transgressors your way. You're, gonna, you're not going to teach anybody anything. After everything you've done, would be the reaction some of us would have. 
David saying, in spite of this, maybe because of this, I want to teach people, don't sin against God. It's not worth it. It's not, nothing good comes out of it. Except unless you repent, then some good can come out. And I will teach transgressors your way. So notice that David doesn't stay in the dumps. He talks about joy. Sinners will be converted to you, verse 13. And he wants to sing aloud God's righteousness in spite of what he's done. He doesn't feel unqualified now to do it. Yeah, he fasted seven days while the child lived, hoping God would change his mind about letting their child die. But once his son did die, David got up, he ate, he got back to the land of the living. So if you deeply repent, what no matter, I struggle with that. If it's a really bad thing, I struggle with getting back into life. When David numbered Israel, God killed 70,000 in a plague. 70,000. The stories in 1 Chronicles 21. God sent an angel to Jerusalem, verse 15. 1 Chronicles 21, 15. 1 Chronicles 21, 15. To destroy Jerusalem. As he was destroying, Jehovah looked and relented of the disaster and said to the angel, who was doing the destroying, it is not, he said, it's enough. Strain your hand. So the angel of the Lord is probably was the one who became Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. David lifted up his eyes, saw the angel of Jehovah standing between heaven, heaven and earth, having his hand drawn, in his hand a drawn sword, stretched out over Jerusalem, so David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. In deep repentance, I hope you learn to do that also. Not just put your head on your bed side, but get right down on the carpet or floor or dirt. Put your head right in the dirt, in the ground, in the grass, in the, on the carpet, whatever. Really humble yourself. David said to God, was it not I? who commanded the people to be numbered. I am the one who has sinned. Here's another time he sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, God, these sheep. What have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. See his attitude in his prayer of repentance? I'm showing you this so you and I know how to repent. Besides just saying, forgive us our debts as we forgive those. Forgive us, uh, whatever, who sinned against us. You can read the rest of the story, 1 Chronicles 21. God used that spot where David was, the threshing floor. God used that spot to build the temple of God through Solomon. I need to give a blog or short sermon on threshing floors. It's very fascinating. So once we're in God's family, read this, Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes holy and those who are made holy, both he who sanctifies and those being sanctified, as your Bible might say, are of the same family, are of one, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So if you know God, you'll get back up, back in the fight. Jesus is not ashamed of me, in spite of everything I've done. Jesus is not ashamed of you, in spite of everything you've done. If you repent, he's not ashamed to call you his brother. That's my brother over there, to identify with you, to let you be among him and his people. So remember in heaven, every time you repent deeply, you're celebrating going out as you deeply cry out in deep repentance. People might speak of you or others. Oh, that man's totally, he's a disgraced member of the church. He's a disgraced minister. Look what he did. He was a televangelist and blah, blah, blah. Disgraced. You go back and you remember Romans 5, the last two verses of Romans 5. 
that where sin abounds, God's grace superabounds. It is how we end up that counts in the end. It's how we end up that counts. We are expected to be converted, to turn back to God, to change, to grow. And God also tells us, quit looking back. Look at Philippians 3.12. Uh, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, this is the last half of the verse, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I'm so bad at that, going back all the time and feeling bad about something I can't change. Paul says, stop. I know I'm speaking to some of you. Stop. Stop reliving those sins and your regrets, or God forbid that you relive any joy or delight in the sin. Don't look back. Reminds you of Lot's wife, right? Don't look back. So it's very important that you understand and I understand. All of us are not yet what we want to be. We're not yet what we're going to be. But after repentance, we are no longer what we were. So I hope you see that no matter how bad the sin was that you committed, God still loves you, wants you to repent, enjoys your repentance. He is now, our Christ is now our life. Our confidence now is in Jesus Christ. So he's the resurrection and the life. And we have to come see ourselves that in the flesh nothing good dwells, like Paul said, and we call it wretched man that I am. I am a sinner. That's the wretched part. It's forgiven now. Now we let the resurrection Jesus be our life. I'm going to put in the notes, Philippians 3, verses 7 to 14. Would you read those on your, on your own? And Paul says, all that carnal stuff of my past, all my great achievements, all my trophies, all those plaques on the wall, that how great I was. I consider garbage now, dung, one translation says. All I want to know now, verse 9, I want to be found in him, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, this righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God by faith. A lot of you haven't learned this yet, this verse. A lot of you resist this verse, that we don't become more and more righteous just by copying Jesus' life, even with the Holy Spirit. Paul said he failed doing it that way. And the Bible in the New Testament, in Hebrews, and Romans, and so many, even in, in the book of Peter, uh, it talks about the righteousness of God by faith, that God imputes his righteousness, the gift of God's righteousness, Romans 5.17 that's exactly what I just read. I don't want my righteousness from my own efforts, from the law, from the Torah. That's not my aim. Verse 9, Philippians 3, 9, But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God by faith, that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The resurrection, Jesus, is now my life. When it's all said and done, and we're at the wedding supper, Revelation 19, I believe in heaven. I have three sermons on the wedding of the Lamb, or the marriage supper. I think it's the wedding of the Lamb is the title. Look them up. Look them up. At that point, you and I, in the time we're up there, and they're outside time and space, God can take as much time as he wants. You are going to be given a brand new name, and there'll be nothing negative about it. It's like Hebrews 11, nothing negative. People might remember us a certain way, but not God. God's going to give you a new name reflecting the way he sees you. Humanity likes to define people by the worst they've ever made, ever done. Samson and Delilah, you know, David and Bathsheba and Uriah, right? Martha, Martha, Rahab the harlot, Peter and his denials three times, doubting Thomas. Oh, Thomas is doubting Thomas. Give the guy a break and let him be, start over. God's going to. God's not like that, where he just looks at the bad stuff. He sees us how we have faith in his grace and the work of Jesus Christ covering us now. There's nothing bad recorded about the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. Nothing. 
So our job is to now focus on Jesus Christ. He's the mirror. And what you look at, focus on, and spend your time on becomes you. In fact, there's a verse that says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord, that's Christ, is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled face, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, one of my favorite verses, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Don't let your mirror be what other people say about you or think about you or memories of your past sins. That's not the mirror you want. God wants you created in his image, as he says in Genesis chapter 1, the end of chapter 1. Let us make man, mankind, in our image, after our likeness. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. Image of God, image of Jesus Christ. Okay, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. We don't grow in character enough to finally, finally be like Christ. Perfect. The only perfection we'll have is the righteousness of God imputed to us. You will never, trying as hard as you can, ever, be perfectly just like Christ. Paul said he couldn't. Paul said he didn't want that kind of righteousness, but the righteousness which is God's own righteousness given to us by faith. Look at the end of Romans 4 sometimes. Romans 4, verses 20 to 25. Okay, go back and read that one too. Romans 4, 20 to 25, and all of Romans 5. But the main thing is by faith we focus now on him. He is the spirit. We focus on him. And the more we focus on him, the more we become like him, and the more and the less you focus on movies that you have no business watching, because something experienced in depth, I've just heard something on this, uh, is something as if you yourself are the one doing it, experiencing it. So if you're watching adultery, if you're watching murder, if you're watching stabbing, if you're watching heads fly off, it's almost like you're the one doing it. And, and it will be impacting on your brain and your heart that way. Don't do it. Please, my brothers and sisters, when we know we see a brother or sister in terrible sin, we know they've repented. Let them see God's grace, God's love in you, through you. Let you mirror God's love to them. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. I love this phrase, to him who's able to keep you from stumbling. I'd love to get to the point where I can keep from stumbling in sin. I'm going to really commit myself to seeking that from God. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Holy God in heaven, Holy God, Holy Father, Holy Son of God, we come before you and we ask you to lead us to deep, proper repentance. Don't let any of us assume we've done it enough, deeply enough. Lead us through the right repentance. Show us your grace. Help us feel your love, your forgiveness, in spite of what any people might say about me or you or any, I mean anybody else, Father. Lead us to the joy of salvation that David prayed for. Let us know you're not done working with us yet in spite of anything. You've called us to do and be certain kind of people, and we want to complete your calling on us. We know you, Father, said that you will complete what you've started in us, and we call on you to do that. Forgive us all of our sins. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Let us come to you in joy and thanksgiving and know that you're pleased that we've repented. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that cleanses us. In Jesus' name, amen. <music> 
Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.